this uh, is going to be a little bit of a review, but I think it's really worth going over it again. Um, I, there's a lot of new stuff that came up in the last several months, and and when and I think you can't really participate in what we're doing here if you don't. Everyone's going to have to understand this stuff to some level, and um, and so it's and a lot of it hasn't been written down, so it needs to be reviewed. Um, so uh, we're going to we're going to end up talking about the transform function, but I felt it's worth going back to the beginning just to review some terminology. So for some of you who are really on top of this, like, forgive me on that, but I think it's good for us. It's even good for me to go through it again. So um, I've labeled these boxes, one, two, three, four, five, six, and then the last thing is it's got to work there. But, um, so jump in, correct me, ask questions, say you're going too slow, too fast, whatever you want, this is, uh, you know, uh, what would be as interactive as possible. I thought I'd start back with some the temporal memory, uh, and I call it temporal inference here, or sequence memory, or something we've been working for many years now, and just to review some of the concepts in there because it's changed a little bit. I think it changed a little bit about the concepts of them. So we have this thing called the spatial pooler, which is still getting a tremendous amount of play in the, in the um, online forums. I'm not reading any of that stuff. I don't know what people are talking about. <laughs> but the spatial pooler just takes some input and converts it into a 2% SDR, um, and in our current temporal memory, that's just a set of columns. Um, and so it's just a conversion from some unknown sparsity, unknown source, and puts it in a nice form that's representative of the data. Um, and in my mind, you know, we've often used 32 cells per column, but 10 works just as well, so that's how I've been using method. So the temporal memory, basically what, what we form in here is we pick one cell in each of these columns. Um, and the purpose of this, um, is essentially we're forming a unique SDR, or unique representation, for a point in a sequence. So we, I've been talking about this, it's a sequence plus a location in the sequence, or an object plus the location of the object. So if I would memorize a melody, any point in melody, at any point, I will have a unique SDR that represents that melody and that location of that melody, um, and nothing else. These are sort of uh, randomly chosen, these bits, in, within the columns, we select the columns, <coughs> But it's sort of a random SDR, but it's one that maps to the input. So I have sort of a semi-random SDR here representing that, um, that point on a sequence. And, but the way we choose the bits is that we can in the future say, well, did I have the same sensory input at that point in time? So it's, this thing itself has not actually, this SDR actually is not encoding the input. You can't extract it out. You can't say what was the input. But the way, we've, way it's structured is if the, if the input comes in and it selects the same columns, we better have those cells depolarize, and therefore we are, we are basically mapping a sensory input onto a unique representation of sequence and location. And that's a very sparse representation. So I put some of this object location SDR, which is the 40 out of you know, 20,000 cells or something like that. It's almost random. <laughs> it allows verifying the sensory input was the same as before. That's, it's sort of like a, a prediction. Um, and in the sequence memory, the current state of these cells is all you need to do is to predict the next state of the cells. So it's just element after element after element in order. Um, and it's worth remembering that the uncertainty, if you don't know where you are, what, where you are in the sequence, or what sequence you're in, the uncertainty is represented by a union of SDRs. It's not represented by some, necessarily some scale or property, something like that. So basically the system says, okay, I'll form all the possible representations that are unique, that, are, that might be consistent with the current input. And, um, and, and if you just have some input come in, and you don't know what sequence you're in yet, but if you have a series of these in a row uh, of inputs, they'll quickly settle down the only, the only representation that makes sense. So that's what we've been doing for a number of years. But the new interpretation is just to think about it as an object and location on the object. Uh, in this case, the objects are linear sequences. Okay? Questions? So why do you say you can't extract the input? From well, if I just looked at, if I just looked at, if I took all these cells and I brought the activity over here someplace, I can't tell you what the input is. In situ, right here, where they are in this layer of cells, because of the way we structure with the columns, I can verify that the input was the same. But if I project these cells someplace else, I can't say what the input was. There's no way of, I could, I could classify it. I could say, okay, that. I could classify this thing that is this location in this sequence and that input, but that it, on its own, you can't really say what that is. But in this, it's sort of a mechanistic way of saying, 
pick a random SDR, but it's not really random because I can always verify, I'm decoding also the, the input at that time, and therefore I can test if the input is the same. There's a slight twist on it, uh, but it's important in my mind. All right, we had a, there was a, there's a shortcoming in this thing, which is that if you miss a data point, um, then you get lost and you have to start over again. So one missed, you know, one missed input and there's no continuity here. And so we have uh, we, something we've been starting to do with the um, um, natural language processing, we've talked a lot about, that you can add a separate representation of the object itself, which is a pooling operation. This is going to be stable over the sequence. And, um, and we have a mechanism, I'm not going to go through that, proposing a very concrete mechanism for this a few weeks ago. Um, this guy is projecting down onto these cells, onto their apical dendrites. And so if this guy, if you have this object representation, it, it lets you miss a few elements here, and it also helps you quickly, uh, if you don't know where you are in the sequence, if I tell you that you're expecting some sequence, then it'll bias the input to say, okay, uh, given, given I know what sequence I'm looking for, I know exactly where I am much more quickly. So it's a stable over sequences, it's faster to recognize sequences, and it resolves ambiguous inputs. And of course, this representation is easier to classify. I want to say, what am I looking at? I don't have to look at all the individual elements. I can just look it back up. Um, so in the neurons, in the, in the, uh, the pyramidal neuron, the, the horizontal connections would be to the basal dendrites, and then the apical dendrites get this other object representation. So the cells, this, uh, this selects a set of cells that are consistent with the object, and then the input, I don't even, I don't need to go through that anymore. This is stuff we've talked a lot about around. But just worth pointing out that this is a feature we know we need, and we've been starting to implement. Okay, so that's all temporal memory. Any more questions about that? Okay, now we're going to talk about sensory motor inference. And um, I just drew this picture because I thought it might help. Um, this was help. This is how I've been thinking about it. And um, as you know, I've been playing around with objects, and I've been using um, somatic touch sensor as a as the paradigm for this because I think it's clearer to see some of the issues than if you think about vision. So, as you know, I'm often thinking about using a pen, I use that as an example. So, here's, this is a, a touch scenario, this is a vision scenario, and you've got a pen in the real world, that's a real structure, and um, we want to be able to understand that structure, this is not a structure like a sequence, it's an object in the world, um, and at any point in time, let's just talk about the hand, if I'm holding a pen in my hand, um, it's touching various parts of my skin. Um, and if I move the pen, it'll touch different parts of my skin. In the, in the, that's on the hand itself. That's just the physical hand. There's these, you know, these touch sensors around the hand. In the, uh, in the representation in the cortex, in the primary sensory cortex, um, it's a highly distorted representation of your hand because the density of the, the sensory bits or the, the sensory cells uh, is not evenly distributed. So you have very high acuity, a lot of, a lot of, um, uh, sensory neurons are at the tips of your fingers and, and very few on the back of your hand and the palm and so on. So if you go and look in the brain, you have this highly distorted image, if you see, in some sense, of a hand. It's not really an image, but the different parts, of the, the, the tips of the fingers are, are very large and the other parts are small. The amount of dedicated real estate, you're looking at a region of cortex. And um, uh, and of course, as I touch the pen, then different sections of these guys will be, will be active, right? At just different points in time. And so... And so every time I move my fingers, I get a different set of representation, a different set of active places on that uh, region uh, representing. So it's kind of weird to think like, okay, how do I recognize that's a pen? Because it's this really highly distorted thing of all these different patterns are coming in all over the place. Um, the same thing is going on in vision. Here it's a little bit, uh, a little bit misleading because when you think about the retina, you actually are projecting a fairly uh, correct image, if you think about the image, on the retina, at the back of the retina, if you look at the back of the retina. Uh, here on the hand is all these different parts of your hand that are touching it. Here on the retina, we always think, oh, there's an image, you know. Um, but when you get to V1, because of the, 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 because of the phobia and the, and the lack of, um, and lots of weird non-linearities in the retina, um, when you actually get the representation, when you look at this pen, is you get some very highly, it's not even an image, it's just bits and pieces all over the place. It's highly, it's not, you, you can't even see a straight line there. It's, all over the place, and if you move the pen a little bit on your eye, it flips around completely the other way around. So there's really almost no correlation between, there is a correlation, of course, but you, if, you, if you try to look at these patterns of, of activity here, you couldn't possibly think of it as a pen. Um, and, um, and also, it, it's, in both these situations, 
at any point in time, only a small subset of the cortical tissue is actually getting uh, active uh, innervation. So if I was, it's easy to think about like, like looking at a line drawing of a pen. The only points that, uh, the only parts of the retina that are, that are in the V1 that are going to be active are the actual line going through them, and most of the other ones are not. Um, if you looked at a slice of the cortex at different points in time, you would see, and these are representing cortical columns in millimeters squared, not or many columns. Um, at any point in time, in either of these scenarios, you've got some set of uh, activity coming into some set of these columns, and at another point in time, you have some set of activity coming into another set of these columns. And uh, every time you move your hand, every time you move your eye, it's, uh, it's going to be completely changing like that. So this is the, this is the scenario for sensory motor inference. We want to build a model of the objects in the world, and, um, but because of, the way, because of the way the representations occur and how we're moving, this is what's actually going on in the cortex. Um, and you can see there's a parallel between these two, um, hopefully. So, any questions about that? I have question number two. Yeah. So you say it's pulling for object, an object only. Why not just object and location? Um, because you have the information in the end. Yeah. Well, it, it, that's a good question. Um, it turns out, what if I could take all the locations on the object? And I form a pooled representation of all the object location components. Let's say I could form, let's say I could just form a union of them. Um, that would be the object. Uh, an object is essentially all the possible things you could know about the object. It's like um, the definition of a pen is all the or a song is all the different uh, notes in, in order. Um, so in some sense, you could think of this as uh, if you want to think of it as a union of all these things. Uh, then it's the object itself. I mean, that's that's it. There's, there, that's the definition of what an object is. There's all the knowledge about the different components of it. Um, but we don't really want to, we don't, so in some sense, this is a representation of all these. Um, you don't have to do it with the union method. You could do it with another method. But the point is, um, but you, you do want a representation which is independent of the location on the, on the object. I, there are many, you're, we're going to need this in many places to say, this thing is going to be stable no matter where you are on the object, um, and that makes it easy to classify. That's a, something I could give. I could send someplace else to say this is uh, this is a pen, uh, or this is this song, as opposed to each of these representations are very very sparse and unique uh, to particular locations on an object. So we don't want this to represent this. We want it to be we want it to be stable for all these things and unique for all these things. Um, and in some sense, that you can think of that. This is the union of all these. Um, that's the way to think about yeah, it. Yeah, it does include some of the location information, because if you had the same set of inputs but in different order, you'd get a different pooled representation. Uh, well, then it would be a different object. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, I'm yeah. just uh, saying it, okay. it, it does include that information in there. I, I don't think of it that way. I think it was like, oh, if you have the same set of inputs right. in a different order, then it's a different song, and therefore you want a different representation. Yeah, so that, like, that's the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. I'm saying this is a pen, and this is a pen upside down, so I have just information in there or not. Right. No, no, well, no, no, well, no, no. That's at a this point, thing. I was just talking about temporal memory. That's a separate thing. Yeah. Right, I'm going over to the sensory motor inference next, okay? okay. <laughs> So this is all a review so far, up to this point, is a review of basically the work we did six years ago. Okay? And we've been working on it since then. Um, and there's a lot of detailed neural mechanisms in here, which I'm not going to go into at the moment. Okay? Okay, yeah. okay but in, in the temporal memory representation there, yeah. uh, in, the, in that bottom rectangle. Um, Down here? It, no, no, I, I, here. In, the top, in the top drawing in the bottom rectangle. Yeah. Does, does, does the order not matter? Well, this this is the is order. Like, is that this is the same as this. I just yeah. added this layer to it. Yeah. Okay, so so order does matter. The order matters. In fact, that's the only thing that matters here. That is, remember, um, the current state predicts the next state. So my current sparse state here predicts the next state, which then predicts the next state, which then predicts the next state. So the only way this thing works is that these cells predict each other in order. So, so if I'm palpating a pen. That's not, this is not, this is pure temporal memory. This is sequence. Okay, this is. I haven't, I, I stopped, I'm sorry, I didn't make that clear. This was all review of temporal memory up to this point. Right? This is just sequence memory. Now I'm starting at the sensory motor inference. So when we talk about sequence memory, what is the, like, what is the meaning of order here? Like, for example, if I'm looking at the sensors and I'm palpating something, like, you know, I touch with my body. No, no, finger, there's, no, no, that's not. I'm talking pure melodies, sequences, pure sequences of. Of like like speech or language or music, 
That's all it is, pure yeah. sequences. High, uh, we're not talking touch yet. That is, when you're moving the hands, yeah. that's this. I think one thing with uh, the word object doesn't necessarily mean a physical object right. here. It's just a stable, consistently stable sequence or set of patterns. So a song is an object. Uh, so at this point, it's just pure sequences. Yeah. I, I made that transition from here to get to, to physics. We have to get to the transformations before we can handle those other. I, I put it in quotes here because I was here. I called the sequence versus here and object versus location. I should maybe not care. It's, it, it's what Sumitai said is exactly right. We you just I'm trying to make a parallel between our temporal memory and what's going on in sensory motor inference, and uh, and it's a parallel system. It's actually the same system. Um, and so, uh, but you still have to start thinking of this as not as sequences, you have to think about it as objects and how can I model the objects. And there's two ways of modeling an object that we know of. One is because sometimes some objects have this rigid order in which they occur, or semi-rigid order, and other ones are not a rigid order because, they're, because you're moving, right? There's two basic types of sensory uh, inference. Uh, one is like a melody and one is like you're moving your hand, you're moving your sensor through, through the world. Um, um, so I'm starting, it's very, we're going to end up with a system that does both sensory sequences and sensory motor inference in the same set of cells. And so it's important to start using the, the right language for them. So an object is, Subutai said, in this case, my sequence is an object, my melody is an object. It's a structure in the world. And it turns out I can discover that structure because it happens to follow a sort of semi-rigid order. But most of the structure in the world isn't like that. Uh, but that's, we started with that one because it was easiest. Uh, not that it was easy, but it was easiest. That's a, these are very important questions. I don't want to glide over them. If, you, if you're still confused about it, please ask. No, it's good. Okay? Thank you. Uh, I was just trying to set up here again, what I'm trying to set up is the fact that, that what's really going on in the cortex is when you're touching things or even when you're moving your eyes is this really kind of weird stuff that's going on. You have these patterns that are coming all, in and out of all these different parts of these sensory regions over time, and it's not, and the order in which these different things occur is not strict. It basically depends on how you move. If I move my hand one way, I get a different pattern. If I move my hand another way, I get a different pattern. Same with the eyes. If I, if I move my eyes this way, I get a different pattern. If I move my eyes that way, I get a different pattern. So there's no, there's no uh, rigid sequence here, and the different cortical columns are getting different, uh, being activated uh, at different times. Uh, it's a very... It's not like everybody's getting input and doing something at once. Most of, most of the sensors in my hand are not getting any input when I'm touching this pen. And at another moment, some of them are the same and some of them are different. And, um, uh, but it's a subset of all the, the possible sensors in my hand at any point in time. And that's true with the retina too. I'm trying to make that parallel construction there. Although it's very, very tempting to think about this as an image that's moving around. It's not. It's not an image that's moving around. It's, it's a bunch of weird patterns like this <laughs> that's happening. All right. Any further questions on that? Now, what we're going to do is what we're proposing here is a mechanism for how to do how to recognize structure like this when you're moving your sensors, whether it's your hand, or your retina, or something else. It doesn't really matter. Um, and the basic idea here, again, we're looking at again a very small section of cortex, and, and the proposal here is that really like a, uh, what the, you know, the one millimeter cortical column is doing this. But it's the same pictures we have over here. It's the same neural mechanism, the same, neur same neurons. Um, but in order to get sensory motor inference to work, um, uh, there was a, a fairly big insight that came about that had to, had to, had to work. We want to form a series of representations in, in, in this set of columns of cells that again represent the, a, an object and a location on the object. We are then going to pick um, a random cell in each, co each column, if you will, to represent um, the sense input at that point in time. So I can associate on an object like a pen, a particular location on the object, like the tip or the side or the barrel or whatever. I'm going to assign it uh, and, and learn what the sensory input was at that time. Um, and that is the definition of what a pen is or any object is. It's basically you know, what do I sense? You know, I have a unique representation for that object. In its location, and I verify that by is the sensory input correct. There's a huge problem that occurs though um, that this representation we want it to be all in in the coordinate space of the objects. Um, so we need to say this is we need to say what is the location on the object, not the location of the sensor itself. Um, we've talked about this a lot over the last few weeks. And similarly, I have a feature on my on my sensory organ, my fingers or my retina. 
But that feature has to be converted in from sensory space to object space, meaning um, the, the, uh, the, the concept that there's an edge on this pen is, is in pen coordinates. It's, it's a certain type of edge, and yet I would feel it differently if I rotated my finger this way. That's a different input on my finger than this. Um, and so I can't just say my, my the tip of my finger is touching something at that location. I have to know the orientation of the object to be able to, to, to turn it into this sort of pen-centric model. Um, and the, I, I'm not explaining this very well. Um, so before I go further, ask questions. <laughs> is, that, is that clear, Zuha? I have a question related to location. So in sensory motor inference, the location is the location of the object. Because we're talking about an object in physical Yes, space. we're trying to make a model of the object itself, and so that this is location on the object. But if we compare that to the location in the temporal sequence, what is the location in a temporal, like a melody sequence? How would you it, you, it's just serial order. It would be like, um, it's a different type of object, right? A melody is a different type of object. And all I could say is like, this is the fourth note. Oh, okay. So <laughs> it's, it's just like an index. It's just an index. This is really relatively simple. It's just an index, except there's no index number. It's basically... It's only predicted by the previous. Mm -hmm. You can think of a song as just being a one-dimensional okay. thing, and you have a location in the dimension. And only, an object can, is a three-dimensional thing, so it has a three-dimensional. And, the, and, the, and the song, you can only traverse it in one serially. Okay. It's a much simpler type of object. Mm -hmm. um, but the general case is objects have some structure in the world that... Uh, unless you move, um, they, it doesn't change. I mean, so I have to basically discover what the structure is by moving my sensors over, whether I'm scanning it with my eyes or I'm, um, I'm, um, I'm moving my fingers over it. Um, but it's the same concept. Um, but I now have to, I want to form a representation in object coordinates and features on the object space itself. And this requires two things. I only know, my brain only knows the location of my sensor in sensor coordinates, like the, your proprioceptive sense is like, oh, I know where my finger is, um, but I don't know where it is on the object initially. Uh, you know, how do I know I'm touching something? How do I know it's the cap of the, the tip of the pen or something like that? Um, and so we have to transform like a proprioceptive sense into an object position. Uh, so on any, at this point in time, I can tell my index fingers on the cap of this thing, but at another point, um, you know, I could have the same hand position and my index finger would be on that. Now, what the cup? Um, anyway, it has to be converted into. I hope you can get this in your brain. There's like a there's like a model of an object, like a pen, that consists of all the different positions in the, the coordinate space of the pen, and what the features are at each of those coordinate spaces of the pen. And yet, um, those are all in sort of pen centric coordinates. They're not, and so that it, it's independent of where the pen is relative to my body. It's independent of anything. Um, those, that's the definition of the pen. It's not anything related to specifically my position, current position related to it. So, so that, just to make sure, I mean, the object feature, feature in object coordinates, let's say this thing, it's an edge relative to the coordinate frame of the object. Yes. So let's say it's 45 degrees relative to this thing. Yeah. And regardless of whether the sensory input on my finger is this way or that way, yes. um, it's the same set of cells will become active because it's really encoding a feature relative to the object that's, frame, that's not right. the sensory, yes. not the direct sensory so representation. If you think about the cortical column, it's representing the very tip of my finger here. Um, it's getting input in each all these cases, right? But the input it's getting is different. But it's on the same location on the object in right. this case. Um, and I, in, in my, I, you can just do this thought experiment. You can play with this, and you say, I, my perception is of the, I, I'm actually not generally perceiving what's actually coming on my finger. I'm perceiving this, this edge on this pen. If I think really hard, if I really, really attend to the tip of my finger, I can imagine it changing. But most of the time, I just feel like, oh, it's, it's that edge of the pen in pen coordinates. Um, so uh, yeah, so this input is changing, although it's the same location on the object, same object, same location, and yet the input's changing. The, the feature in sensory space is changing. I need to convert it into a feature in object space that is consistent and uh, that is always the same. In order to do that, you need to know the transformation of you the object know, relative to your sense. That's right. And that's that. That's this X form here. You need to know. Um, this is a, a coordinate transformation between this space and the object space. And the, there's a similar, if, I'm not sure it's the same, a coordinate spatial between the location of my sensor and the location on the object. 
Um, yeah. I would think it would have to be some sort of like a quasi recommendation, right? Because I might not always touch it in exactly the same place that I've ever touched it before. Yeah. Yet I will know that it's a pen. There's two components to that when you say fuzzy. Um, the one component might be that it really is fuzzy, and the other component might be saying, well, the next time I touch it, I'm not touching with the tip of my finger, I'm touching here. I'm, right, I might touch a different part of the finger, or I might touch a different part of the pen. Okay, right. those, those, are, those are two more. separate things. Those are separate yeah. things. Yeah. Um, uh, here's, here's the way of thinking about this. Uh, imagine you are a little piece of cortical tissue, with a square millimeter, 100,000 neurons, and you're one of these little guys in the somatosensory cortex, okay? And you're sitting there waiting, and you're representing the very tip of this finger. Now, I'm not getting any input at any time right now. I'm not getting any input. Now, I'm getting some input. Now, I'm not. Now, I'm getting some input. Now, I'm not. Now, I'm getting some input. Right? You're sitting there. Every once in a while, someone comes along and says, here's some input. And if I could know at that time where I was on the object and what the, you know, what the feature was on that object, I can store it. I can say, oh. That, at that point on that object, I should store this little leg, or this little scratchy thing here. Um, and um, that's, and so, with the, the, I'm, I'm gonna get to this, this, this part, first thing up here, let me just jump to this right now, it says, although each column gets input from a small subset of the input space, each column learns models of entire objects. So, over time, this little tip of this finger will, if I play with this object quite a bit, it will learn a lot of different, um, um, it, it will be exposed to many parts of the pen, right? Maybe not all parts of the pen, but many parts of the pen. And, um, uh, and it builds up a model of a pen one sensation at a time. It says, okay, oh, I got an input, let me store what that was. Oh, I got an input, let me store what that is. Oh, I got an input. And all the different parts, all these different cortical regions are doing the exact same thing. They're sort of somewhat independently building up complete models of an object. It's hard to, this is a, a real amazing, revelation in my mind that each of these cortical columns is, is independently building an entire model of the object based on occasional input that it says, oh, here's an input from that object, I'm going to store it. Um, and, um, and so uh, when, when, you're actually in, when you're actually touching this object, only, even though there's maybe thousands and thousands of models here, only a few of them are actually invoked at any point in time, uh, and they're all trying to guess what that thing is based on their current input. And we'll come back to that more so in a moment. Question about the sensory motor. You're saying um, it doesn't matter sort of the orientation, it's just the object and where my finger is touching it. But it do no, I think it does matter the orientation. I need to know the orientation in order to represent the feature in object space and the location in object space. You said it doesn't matter. It matters. I mean But I thought you said the representation was independent. Yes, yeah. representation is independent, but I, in order to get that representation, I need but to don't we need the representation to capture the orientation in order to make a, a, a sensory motor prediction? No. So if I move to the right... Let's, let's talk about the representation stored in these layer 4 cells, in these cells right here, is independent of, of orientation and where it is relative to your sensory organs. This is, the, this is the representation of the object itself. At any point in time, for me to make an inference or a prediction... Uh, I need to know these other, th I need to know these transforms. Oh, right, because you're, yeah. Okay. Right? Yeah, you do that. And you kind of need to, be, in order to do set, you, you kind of need to go back and forth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think the part I was missing was, you can make a predictable thing because your, I presume that your motor command is being translated yes, as well. Yes, yes. So this location in sensory space, it is both the current location and it's also the predicted location. So when, when, when I'm about to make a movement, whether it's an eye movement or a movement of my fingers, um, I get a prediction of what the new sensory location, the new location is going to be. Um, I, I get that, that that motor copy, and and I didn't say where this is occurring, but it's going to make a prediction. This is going to be occurring over the wear pathway. It's going to be making a prediction about where the next location of the sensor is going to be, and I run that through the transform. I get a prediction of the next location on the object. And then I predict the next feature on that object, and then when the feature comes in, I see if it's correct. And that's basically, so there's a predict, this is actual and predicted here. It's interesting, I don't know if you know this, the, we talked about this in one paper, this has been a very bothersome result that we've had, we mentioned this again recently, but in V1, in V1, the primary sensory cortex, they find cells become active uh, at the beginning of a saccade, um, as if they already got their input. 
and and we talked about as they call it like a shifting receptive field or something like that. And we talked about how in the past we said, well, how could that possibly be? How could you making this big saccade over an object? How could that cell predict its own activity uh, over this big saccadic movement? Uh, and the only the way we, in the past we had to rationalize it by imagining the data went up the hierarchy and back down the hierarchy. Uh, it doesn't have to. Each of these guys, each of these little cortical columns, it says, okay, I'm at the next location. Uh, I can predict what I'm going to see. If I know what object I'm looking at, I'll predict what I'm going to see. And um, and you will find that, that it can happen all locally right here. It just doesn't mean... It still has to know what the object is. And you have to know what the object is. So this is on the assumption I'm, I'm viewing an object, I recognize it, I understand it, I know where I am on that object, and now I know where my next movement's going to be. I have a prediction where the, where the retina's going to be next. And, um, and given all that, I just run through this thing. I can predict what... Uh, in this case, these would be these predictions would be silent. They'd be uh, uh, the polarized, but you would see it in layer five, uh, and uh, perhaps in layer one, two. Anyway, the point is that the system can make a prediction of what the input's going to be, um, as long as it gets it. As long as I know what the object is, and I know my current location, and I know what the, the predicted location, the next sensory location is going to be. So in the prediction in this layer, you have this object, predicted object location coming in, and you have the predicted sensory location coming in. Predi uh, predicted like like this the, is a, this is from the proprioceptive. Yeah, but it's it converted into the object. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It gets predicted. And then you have the object representation. Is it so? You don't even need lateral connection. Um, at this, as I've described it right here, no, you don't. If you look at layer four cells, um. They they get something I forget the exact numbers. It's like sixty percent of the input come to these to these cells come. Uh, 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 we're not talking about the the, the proximal, but the the the, distal. the, the distal, the ninety percent. Uh, sixty percent of those inputs come from layer six, and like another twenty percent come from uh, the wear pathway, um, and there's a small percentage of the local uh, between the layer four cells. That's okay. very different than layer three, where if you go up to upper layer three. You find that almost all the connections are horizontal between each other, which is consistent with sequences. But in this case, um, very few of the connections are actually between the cells themselves. Uh, the vast majority of them come from elsewhere, which is consistent with this model. Yeah, that's what we had in our sensory motor inference thing in the past. Yes, as well, would be. Yes. Well, the, the big, you know, in, in hindsight now, what we did in the past was very naive because we didn't really have any concept at all about these sort of um, object coordinates. <laughs> And, uh, and we quickly ran into scaling problems, and sure, you're going to run into scaling problems <laughs> because the, it, the model has to be an object-oriented uh, model, and down height science is obvious, but uh, it wasn't obvious at the time. Um, <laughs> yeah. I feel bad. I did all that work. It was useful. Um, okay. So... Um, I'm going to go down through this set of things here again. This is the basic idea. So again, each column gets an input from a small set of the input space. Each column learns a model of an entire set of objects. And therefore, a cortical region is a set of nearly identical models operating in parallel. Only a subset of them are actually getting input at any point in time. That's, that's sort of reflected with these little green dots down here. There's an easy little model sitting there sort of independently going, oh, here's the input. I'm going to try to remember it. Here's the input. I'm going to try to remember it in this, in this structure here. Um, the object itself, what object you're, you're, you're observing, and the orientation of the object relative to the body must be de to determine dynamically. You don't know that up front, unless some, you know, this is some supervised physical. And there's two ways you can determine that. So I, I just get some input. I reach my example I've been using. I reach my hand into a black box. I don't know what I'm going to feel. I don't know what I'm going to feel it. And I reach around, and I touch something with my finger, just with the tip of my finger. I don't really know what it is yet. Um, but if I do successive movements of touching thing on my finger, I go, oh, I say, starting to feel like a coffee cup. Okay, yes, 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 it's a coffee cup. Or what normally happens, it's so the successive movements will be a way of, of, of differentiating, to, to narrowing down the possibilities of what the object is, in the same way that successive inputs on the temporal memory do that. I don't know the mechanism for that yet, so we have to figure that out. Um, but the, the, the other big thing that's going on here is that if I touch something with multiple sensors at the same time, multiple fingers, for example, and so I light up a bunch of these guys in, in S1. Um, they can share their, their guesses of what the object is and what the transformation is. 
So each of these units will say, like, oh, I have an input that's an edge like this. That could be on an object, I, and I, it could be one of many things. And another guy saying, well, I'm sensing this over here. It could be one of many things. And if you take them as a whole, uh, and what I propose is that in, in layer two, what you see in layer two is that although you have these, um, I didn't draw it here, let me just, if I think about these are the cortical columns. In the upper layers here, they actually have long range connections. And so that would be the sort of object representation. And so what I propose, what's going on, I'm pretty sure this is going on, is that um, they're, they're forming cell assemblies that are consistent with an object. And so everybody gets to sort of vote what they think the object might be. And there's only one consistent one across them. So very quickly, if you have multiple sensors sensing something, each one has a very poor understanding on its own what it might be. But very quickly, they by sharing their 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 um, their object representation and the transform representation, they can very often quickly in a single sensation tell you what it is. So if I reach into the box with my whole hand and I pick up this, I don't have to move my hands. I know it's my coffee cup. Uh, if I just touch it like that, I don't know what it is. I have to, if I had like 10 or 100 of these guys active at once, they can all quickly settle on the only example, the only, the only thing that makes sense, which is my coffee cup. And the orientation. So these, these have to get, this is, both of these are going on. Um, you need to use successive movements to learn. There's no way I can learn what this coffee cup is uh, as a child unless I touch it continuously. Um, because all these guys have to be trained. But once they're all trained, I can just go and I get it, um, and, I, and you'll have it very, very quick. And this is how why you can do um, uh, flash inference in V1, and we used to think like, oh, it has to require hierarchy. It does not require hierarchy. It can actually happen very low down in the hierarchy, and same thing with S1. You just, you know, one, one multi-sensor grasp is often enough to tell you what the, uniquely identify the object, and if not, then a couple of movements with your hand will do it, or a couple of movements with your eyes will do it. Um, so if you see a very ambiguous picture, um, you, you may not recognize what it is right away, but if you move your eyes a few times, you will uh, often, and uh, same thing with touch. Um, but often, you can just do it in one grasp. But you have to learn it by, by, the learning requires many, many, many sensations, moving your eyes over many times, and also touching the object many times. And that's what children do. They just sit there and palpate the objects continuously all day long, uh, building up these models. Okay, so that's a big thing right there. Um, these are, I, this is my list of sort of the big uh, new ideas that are that have come out in the last few months. So, um, yeah, you got each column is doing its entire set of uh, an object on its own. A region is a set of nearly identical models acting in parallel. Um, this, these, this, what the object is and the orientation of the object must be dynamically determined one of like these two means. And finally, there's this idea that we have to have a conversion between a location in sensory space to a location in object space and a feature in sensory space to a feature in object space. And uh, as I argued a few weeks ago, um, trying to figure out where these conversions are, I, I've convinced myself that they're occurring right here in layer four and three, um, uh, at least for the feature conversion is happening there. Um, and, and then I proposed mechanisms for doing that. And, and that's a, this is a big idea that I don't think anyone else has proposed before, at least I'm not aware of it. Yeah. Joe, so here in number two, you're describing a region as a set of nearly identical models, right? Yeah. I was kind of thinking of region as a physical region. Uh, is it not that's what I'm saying. Or, physical or, or is it both? It's, I'm talking about that's a physical region. Right. So the way I think about V1 yeah. or S1 or any region now is you take these quarter columns, or about a, about a, set, about a millimeter squared, right. about, about 2,000 columns, right in line with what we've done. Um, and um, and and you when I think of V one now, I'm thinking that it's it's all these little guys are all trying to learn. Some of this is new, and some of it is new, but it's conceptually in my mind different. All of them are learning complete models of the world. Every one of them, as, as much as they can. There's going to be a limit um, how much they can learn, but it's going to be a pretty big limit, even for a small column. Um, they're going to learn a complete model of all the things they, they get exposed to, and, and they're all doing it in parallel. And where the conventional view of V one is is like, okay, and this and the conventional view is not completely wrong. It's like this little section of B1 only is some sort of filter or only can be exposed to a certain part of the sensory input space, a certain part of the retina. And therefore, in order, but the conventional view says if you want to form an, uh, a representation of an object, you have to go up the hierarchy to do it. 
And I'm not denying that you can move going up the hierarchy, but I'm saying you can do a hell of a lot more in one region than anyone thought about, uh, at least than anyone I was aware of. Uh, so it's not just processing some small part of the input space. At any moment in time, it's getting a small part of the input space, but it has a complete model of the world because over time, it sees different products of others. So when I think about V1 now, I think about a whole bunch of little, little models of the world running in parallel. There are, there's lots of little models all kind of learning basically the same thing that are running in parallel. So if I put on this kind of funky glasses, right? Yeah. Where, um, you know, they're not like transparent except for the hole, like a bunch of holes, right? Yeah. What that would mean is it would block input to some parts of the retina, right? Yeah. yeah but only expose uh, some parts of the retina to input, right? Yeah. And so then uh, the, where the holes are is, I'm, I'm guessing, is the, those uh, portions of the retina would feed input to particular columns. Yes. And I could still recognize objects, yes. even though some... some yeah, some it basically, it, it, this just handles the, the occlusion problem. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be funky glasses. There could be a tree in front of me. You know, sure, you're looking at me through yeah. a bunch of branches. Right. And, uh, and you still see me. Right. Yeah. Uh, it's also, uh, yes, so it's, it's essentially, um, you don't have to have, as long as enough of these guys are active, well, actually, it's gender neutral, <laughs> enough of these, these people, I don't know, enough of these, enough of these cortical columns, enough of these cortical columns are, um, uh, are active and enough of them that can vote, then you, you're good. And I made a comment the other, uh, a couple weeks ago, like, that's why you don't see the whole, you know, the, 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 there's these rivers of, um, of blood vessels going to your retina where you, you just, you know, retina has got, the, it's got the, the optic, you know, it's got the blind spot, plus it's, it's all these blood vessels, your retina is not a, a, a uniform thing. It's, it's got lots of holes in it already, right. and you don't notice them. It's, right. not, be, no, but it's not because we're filling it in, it's you known it because there's enough guys who see the input, enough input that they can all vote and say, yeah, I know what it is. So bingo, done. It's a, it, it really changes that perspective quite a bit. Yeah. Um, and uh, and it, it does explain a lot of things. I mean, it can explain why you can have damage to your retina and you wouldn't notice it, you know? <laughs> Or holes in it, and similarly, I could, I could create a, uh, I could create a hand, um, an artificial hand that just has a few sensors on it, and it would work. You know, we're going to do a build, build a robotic hand. I don't have to have a thousand sensors here. I can just have a few on certain, make sure they're touching the object, and it should work. Um, gives you a lot of questions.